So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us so many tonight. As uh, many of you will know, my name is Michel and I'm delighted to host Professor Roger Barker who will be talking to us about, is it possible to repair the brain in Parkinson's disease using cell-based therapies, an important topic. I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. So if you are seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, this is not the right place. You should consult a medical professional, you know that. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. So please put your questions on the chat and we will see them uh, creeping up as we progress. I will go through them after, after the presentation from, from Roger is over. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the group for those of you who don't know it. Uh, a small group was created after some of us attended the tutorial on nutrition and Parkinson's during the summer 2020, almost two years ago and decided to stay in touch. Now we decided to, to name our small group, No Silver Bullet. I think it says it all, but it was reflecting the belief that we need a holistic approach to manage, to manage our symptoms and that there is no silver bullet unless proven wrong, which I would love to hear. Uh, we do host external speakers every couple of weeks. Many of you have attended sessions in the past. Those speakers are selected to help us think holistically about the various ways of managing our symptoms. And today is no exception to that. So in addition to our YouTube channel where we post recordings of our sessions, we also have an Instagram page and a Twitter feed. The details are on the chat. But let's come back to today's topic. As I said earlier, we are very fortunate to have Professor Roger Barker with us today. He will be talking to us about is it possible to repair the brain in Parkinson's disease using cell-based therapy. Among many other things, uh, or many things that he does in his life, Professor Barker is a professor of clinical neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. And he's a consultant neurologist at the Adam Brooks Hospital. In addition to this, he's the primary, investig primary investigator in the Wellcome MRC, Cambridge Stem Cell Institute. His research seeks to better define the clinical heterogeneity of Parkinson's and Huntington's diseases and their treatment, especially with experimental cell engine based approaches. So I think you will all agree that he's a, a perfect speaker to talk to us tonight about using cell therapies to target Parkinson's disease. So Professor Roger, if I can do it that way, please go ahead, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for joining this evening. I'm now going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, you should be able to do that. And if I do that and then put it yes. into that mode, does that look? Uh, it's perfect. Perfect. OK, so I've, I've changed the title a bit, Michelle, but it's the same basic principle. <laughs> about how, as, as long as you haven't changed the topic in town <laughs> yeah it's not quite the same as edinburgh where they introduced me to, where they uh, i was going to talk on cell-based therapies and that was the first i'd heard of it so, <laughs> as i was doing an update surprise. on the last 10 years so it's a slight change but anyway i'm going to talk about this so in this talk i'm going to basically um sort of walk you through i mean obviously what park disease is and that's not uh, because you don't know what Parkinson's is, I think it's important to understand the principles by which we're trying to use cells to uh, repair the brain in Parkinson's. Uh, so understanding the core concept. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is we're trying to do with, when we're repairing the brain in Parkinson's disease. Then I'm going to talk a little bit, which involves a little bit about subtypes of disease. Then I'm going to talk about a study called the Transuro study, which was our study, which recently finished, where we tried to repair the brain using fetal dopamine cells. So these are cells collected from aborted feces. So they are not stem cells, they're primary dopamine nerve cells. And then I'm going to move on to where we're going, which is with stem cell based therapies. So stem cell based dopamine replacement therapies for Parkinson's disease and tell you where the world has got to and where we've got to in Europe and when things are likely to happen and are happening now. So it's exciting times. And I will try and walk you through this and hopefully you'll find it an interesting story and also understand where we've got to. And then at the end, I'm very happy to take uh, any questions on any of this. So uh, this is a simple question, to which there is no simple answer, which is what is Parkinson's disease? But I think it's important to begin with this concept for two reasons, really. One is that the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, or the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, as you're probably aware, is made clinically. So it's entirely dependent in uh, 2022 on what the person seeing you thinks that you've got. And so there are obviously key features to Parkinson's disease which give you that suspicion. And you can do scans to look at a loss of dopamine in the brain. But at the end of the day, uh, in early stage disease, which is not where we are with these therapies yet, but ultimately maybe where we go with these cell-based therapies, you have about a 90% chance of getting it right. And that's important because when we come on to talk about the trials, 
some of the patients who've ended up in trials with experimental therapies have not responded well to the uh, approach using dopamine cell therapies. And that's probably because they don't have Parkinson's disease. So obviously, if you don't treat everybody uh, with the condition that you think you've got, then that creates a uh, problem. So that's worth bearing in mind. But fundamentally for our discussion tonight, the diagnosis defined clinically, pathologically by uh, the formation of these protein aggregates, these Lewy bodies, and critically for our discussion, they fall, sorry, they fall within these dopamine cells at the top of the stem of your brain in a place called the midbrain within the substantia nigra. And in your substantia nigra, you have about four to 500,000 dopamine cells, and they project up to a thing called the striatum, which is up the top here. I'm not sure if my uh, mouse works here. Uh, and when you've lost half of those cells, you develop the first motor features of Parkinson's disease. So if we just start from that simple view, then 200 to 300,000 dopamine cells, once you've lost them, you develop the first features of Parkinson's disease. In other words, if you have two or 300,000 dopamine cells, you don't have Parkinson's disease, at least the features which respond to dopamine. So that seems like quite a lot of cells, but actually a couple of hundred thousand compared to the billions you have in your brain is doable. So it's a small number of cells that are lost. And currently, uh, we know that those are critical for the expression of Parkinson's disease because everything we do in the clinic in Parkinson's disease is either using drugs that work on the dopamine system or drugs that deal with the complications of drugs that work on the dopamine system. So monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they're drugs like rosagiline and selegiline, they stop the breakdown of dopamine. We have all of these other drugs which stimulate the dopamine system. Amantadine, which is used to treat the complications with the involuntary movements, the dyskinesias. And then as you advance through the condition, there are more advanced therapies like deep brain stimulation, apomorphine and duodopa. So uh, we know that Parkinson's disease is um, uh, critically uh, dependent on the loss of those dopamine systems. So we have lots of dopamine therapies which are very effective uh, for treating that. So that also creates a problem because when we come to talk about cell-based therapies, they're going to have to be as good as what we've got out there already. So this isn't like trying to use a cell therapy for motor neuron disease for example, where we've got nothing. Here we have lots of good therapies. So for this treatment to be competitive, it's going to have to do uh, something quite significant. And I think that's also important when we come to consider how trials are designed as to whether we need sham surgery and placebos and all of that. So that critically is what Parkinson's disease is. It's a clinical diagnosis, pathologically defined by the presence of these protein aggregates, a key pathology within the dopaminergic system for which we have many effective therapies, which we know are very effective in early stage disease. So when we come to talk about repairing the brain in Parkinson's disease, what we're actually talking about is simply repairing this pathway. So as you will be aware, the pathology of Parkinson's disease is not confined to that structure. It is uh, disseminated. So it probably starts outside the brain, affects the gut, can affect the heart, uh, affects other areas in the brain and lots of non-dopamine signs. So whatever these cell-based therapies do, they are not a cure. They're not a cure because they don't treat all the other problems that you have with Parkinson's disease. But as I'll come on to say, in selected patients, this is the primary and major problem. And most importantly, it's not getting rid of the protein aggregates. So in much the same way as uh, taking Ventolin inhaler helps your asthma, that helps the symptoms of asthma, but it doesn't get rid of the asthma. The asthma is an inflammatory response. So here we're not getting rid of the protein. We're not curing people of Parkinson's we're simply trying to better treat one aspect of it, which is the loss of that dopaminergic pathway. So how could we repair that? Well, you don't need to be a genius to work out how you could repair it. There are two fundamental ways in which you could do it. You can regrow it. So you pour in some fertilizer to try and regrow that pathway. And I'm not gonna talk about that tonight, but that's had a somewhat checkered history. So there's these, all of these letters have been used as growth factors. So probably the most famous of which is GDNF, glial cell line derived neurotrophic factor. The idea here is you uh, infuse or inject into someone's brain with Parkinson's disease, one of these uh, growth factors that will then stimulate the remaining dopamine cells and dopamine fibers to grow back to full health. So it's a bit like a poorly rose, 
a poorly flower, you put some fertilizer on it and you try and regrow that system. And that's probably had quite a checkered history because quite a lot of the problems, I think, have been that they've put fertilizer into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease when all the flowers have gone. So uh, the analogy is if you have a flower bed with the best fertilizer in the world, which you put on it, but there are no bulbs or seeds in there, however good the fertilizer is, nothing will grow. And so if you wait till people have had Parkinson's disease for 5, 10, 15 years, which many of these trials have done, there is nothing left to grow. The system has disappeared. And so the growth factors won't work. So I think there has to be a little bit of a rethink about how we do this. And that's currently ongoing. And trials with GDNF are now uh, in the clinic again. Uh, I think there was a patient done last year in Germany in a trial uh, funded by Bayer. But what I'm going to be talking about uh, tonight is the idea that we lose these dopamine cells. So I'm not going to try and repair them. Uh, they've got some uh, fatal pathology within them. Those that have died have died and given you the symptoms. The rest will eventually die. So putting in something to try and rescue it is helpful, but it's never going to solve the problem because the pathology will eventually overwhelm the system. What I want to do is say, let's put back the missing dopamine cells. Let's make some nice, new, fresh dopamine cells, put them in the brain, and replace those that have lost. And in theory, they should not succumb to the disease, but I'll come back to that. Uh, and they should work as well as the uh, dopamine cells you've already lost. So it's a very simple approach. And as I say, we're not looking to replace vast numbers, just a few hundred thousand. Now, why do we think this is uh, uh, worthwhile? Uh, because, as I've already said, this loss of the dopaminergic system we know is core to the expression of the problems in Parkinson's disease. And we know that's a core problem because of the fact that, uh, as you all know better than I do, if you give people dopamine drugs, at least in the early stages of disease, it works extremely well. The problem is they don't last forever, these drugs, in terms of the efficacy or the consistency of their response. So the best you will ever achieve with a dopamine cell-based therapy is the same as the best response you'll get with a dopaminergic drug, which for a lot of people is a very significant improvement. It also has two advantages over drug use. Well, it probably has more than that, but there are two simple ones. The first is that you're actually uh, replacing dopamine where it's needed. So you lose these uh, dopamine cells, which project up to this structure called the striatum, in particular to an area called the putamen, and you're going to put the dopamine cells back in that system. The other dopamine systems you have in your brain are largely intact. In fact, some of them are overactive in early Parkinson's disease, and some of the complications, therefore, that you see with uh, your dopaminergic drugs are due to overstimulation of intact systems, such as uh, people seeing things, some of the cognitive thinking problems. So this has the advantage that you'll put dopamine just where it's needed and avoid all the side effects from stimulating dopamine systems that are intact elsewhere. The second advantage is that when you take a drug, it gets taken into your uh, gut, it gets absorbed through the gut, absorbed into the brain, taken into the brain, converted into dopamine. It's a pretty blunt tool for the finesse with which your dopamine system normally works. Here, what we're doing is we're putting dopamine back in the form of dopamine cells, dopamine nerve cells, and they will release dopamine accurately and carefully through connections between cells and won't be flooding the whole system all of the time. So the physiological replacement of dopamine just where you need it in theory, if it works, will give you the best response you get with your dopamine uh, drugs now. You will only need a one-off treatment because once the cells are there and they've grown and survived, they will be releasing dopamine hopefully forever. They will avoid the complications you get, side effects from the dopamine drugs, including dropping blood pressure as well as these neuropsychiatric problems. And in theory, it should stop you getting L-dopa-induced dyskinesias, these involuntary movements with chronic dopamine drugs. So whilst it's not curative, in theory, it could be a one-off treatment that puts that system back to normal and you will stop taking any medication. And in 2022, if that worked, it would essentially make everything we do in the clinic currently redundant around drug therapies. So whilst people will tell you it's not curative and it's not to say we shouldn't be looking for a cure, the, the potential this has to actually uh, completely change the natural history of Parkinson's disease is very uh, significant. So 
that set the scene. We know what we're about to do. We're trying to understand what we're trying to do and the advantages of this approach. So then the next question is, I understand that, Roger, I understand dopamine is critical. I understand there's a loss of a certain number of cells. I can understand why you want to replace it. So should we give it to everybody? So everyone with Parkinson's, get in the line. Let's just give it. Now, I think this is a bit more complicated uh, uh, than uh, people think. And actually, when I began this program of work on cell replacement for Parkinson's disease, when I came back to Cambridge in the late 90s, the first question I asked myself was actually, is this suitable for everybody with Parkinson's disease? Or do we need to be a bit clever about who will be the people who will best benefit from this? And in order to understand that, I thought, well, we have to understand what happens to Parkinson's disease naturally. What's the natural history of this condition? And amazingly, when we did this study at the turn of the century, there had been no studies on the natural history of Parkinson's disease as it occurs in the community. People had studied their own patients in clinic, uh, which was you know, small numbers, but they're obviously people who turn up at your clinic. So you know, if I looked, for example, at our Parkinson's research clinic when I started, average age of patient was about 53, average IQ was about 132. And of course, the reason our clinic had such an odd distribution was we had all the Cambridge professors who had Parkinson's coming along to our clinic because that's what they wanted. That's not how it occurs in the general population. So we set about trying to better understand what Parkinson's actually look like at the community level out there in the real world. So this was a study called the Campaign Study, which was led originally by Tom Faulkner, which some of you will know, who uh, is now a professor down in London, had a very successful career, but this was Tom's first project when we worked together. And in fact, he was my first clinical fellow. And so the idea here was to collect everyone with Parkinson's disease in the county of Cambridge here over a two year period, follow them over time and see what happens to them. So this, as I say, was called the campaign study, and we followed people over uh, time, and we're still following them up. And so you come to some sort of figures uh, on just uh, interesting natural history. So average age to get Parkinson's disease is 70. If you look at death rate in the population with people with Parkinson's disease, it's no different in the community to the death rate uh, from not having Parkinson's disease. In other words, if you look at the population as a whole, Parkinson's disease does not shorten your life. Most people die with Parkinson's disease, not of Parkinson's disease, which may be a bit of a morbid fact, but it's quite an, um, I think, comforting fact uh, to know that. And most people, if you go to America, they'll say the average age to get Parkinson's disease is 59. That's the average age to get Parkinson's disease and get healthcare in America. That's not the average age you get it in the community. Uh, if you look at complications from Parkinson's disease, about 40% of people develop a dementia, sadly, within 10 years. And most people have developed motor fluctuations i.e. some having some on-off uh, responses 10 years into their illness. So we can start to actually understand what naturally ha happens with Parkinson's disease. We can tell people what we expect will happen, and we can make some predictive models. But the important point for our discussion tonight was, can we identify a group of patients who we think might be optimally placed to receive dopamine therapy? And so uh, we've repeated this study, but for our discussion tonight, we essentially came up with two types of Parkinson's. They're not really two types. They're just people who sit at either end of a sort of spectrum. At one end, there are younger patients. So these uh, tend to be people in their 50s, early 60s. They can have some subtle thinking problems, but they are not in themselves predictive of anything bad. Uh, uh, in comparison, there are older patients, typically in our study over the age of 72, who when they first present to uh, their doctors, actually have some subtle abnormalities in terms of coming up with lists of animals. That's what semantic fluency is, drawing pictures, so visual, spatial, and other memory problems. And these people sadly tend to develop uh, an early uh, dementia and tend to do less well and have a more malignant form of the disease. Now, whilst that can be a bit disheartening, it has quite important implications for how we think about rolling out experimental therapies. So having described that we think there are these sort of two extremes of disease, and a lot of people obviously sit somewhere between this, we try to understand why that was. And the, one of the key factors, obviously, age, whatever that was, however that affects it. Uh, we have found genetic risk factors. And also, interestingly, Caroline Williams Gray, who runs her own research group, but was in my group for a number of years, has shown that levels of inflammation in the bloodstream when you present seem to correlate with how well you'll do with your Parkinson's disease. Now, the important point for our discussion here is that this allows us 
to develop models, to explore the basis for it, but particularly for trialing therapeutic uh, agents. So obviously this group who are younger, who have these subtle deficits, seem to have a disease that's very much targeting the dopaminergic network. Whereas the patients who tend to fall on the other side tend to have a more malignant, aggressive form of the disease. Now that's important because if I was to do a trial of say a dopamine cell-based therapy, best dopamine cell therapy in the world, I take the first 10 patients that pitch up to the clinic, five are in the good group, five are in the older group, that's nice and fair, I've included everybody. I'm gonna wait three years and at the end of three years, I'm gonna say, how do you feel for your therapy? So a nice you know, uh, quality of life assessment. Well, the five who are the younger patients, uh, they will say, well, actually, I'm pretty crackerjack. I'm pretty good. These therapies work very well. I feel much better. Uh, I'm not uh, requiring any drugs. Thank you very much. That's been very good. The older five patients, sadly, have progressed. They've developed problems with falling. They've developed cognitive problems. They've developed blood pressure problems. And I'll say, well, how's the uh, cell therapy helped for you? And they'll say, well, it hasn't helped. In fact, to be quite honest with you, I've got much worse over the last three years since you gave me that cell therapy. So now we say, well, five patients have done well, five have done badly. We sum them together and you say, it doesn't work. I mean, overall, there's no real difference here. Put it in the bin. Let's go back and start again. So whilst it's a shame that we can't use this therapy for everybody, we could easily lose sight of what is actually helpful by just pulling everyone together. And you sort of think this, we sort of say, well, this is great new concept, but it's not a new concept at all. If you think about people with cancer, uh, when I was training in the dark ages, if you had, for example, breast cancer, you'd be diagnosed with breast cancer, you had one treatment, that was it. As years have gone on, the oncologist, the cancer doctor said, well, there's lots of different types of breast cancer. Some of them respond to this drug, some of them respond to that drug, some behave more aggressively than others. And so there's much more of a tailoring of treatment to the type of disease you've got. And I think this is one of the important things we have to think about with Parkinson's disease. So on the positive side, if one's in the bad prognostic group, if you like, those who are older who tend to progress more quickly, they are the perfect group for trying to stop the disease with all these disease-modifying therapies. Currently, this is the very group that are excluded from all of the trials looking at disease-modifying therapies. So the people who tend to be in the good group end up also being tested for drugs to try and slow down the disease, which is fine, except it's blooming hard to show that someone's slowing down the disease when they're already doing rather well with their disease in the first place. So I think this understanding of subtypes of disease is important. And it was this principle that we took forward in our first cell-based therapy trial, which was this transuro study. So this was a study where we had two arms to it. The first was to collect about 150 people with younger onset Parkinson's disease, the type that was on the uh, left as I was looking at on my slide, and saying, we want to collect these patients, follow them over time, and then we're going to select some of these patients to put some dopamine cells into their brain. So the first question we have to ask is, well, did we get it right? So I've already said, I think this group are going to do quite well if we select them. So this was a paper we published on it. This is all of the criteria. Details are not important. But the important point is this slide here. These are the changes over time in the first three years of the 100 odd patients we collected as part of this Transuro study. And most of this looks uh, in a complete gobbledygook. But the important thing is if you look across the top, uh, as you go up, uh, you're getting worse. So these are various Parkinson's disease rating scales. And what you can see over the first 36 months of which we collected patients people got a little bit worse over time. Well, that's quite useful because if they didn't get worse over time, it's going to be very hard to show that we've actually stopped them getting worse over time. And that's what you would expect. The important point is down in figure D, which is looking here at the thinking. So 100 is the best you can do. Below 84, we think you've got uh, major thinking problems. We took people who didn't have thinking problems and they never developed thinking problems. In fact, they got a bit smarter at answering their questions. So this was the group that, uh, progressed in a very linear fashion, didn't develop any thinking problems. And this thing here is about involuntary movements. The old dopa induced dyskinesias, we're trying to avoid people who develop bad dyskinesias, and we seem to do that. So our transuro study, which was predicated on the grounds that we knew were the right type of patients to select, has proven to be true. So we know the group that we think will do best with cell-based therapies. It's not to say that other people couldn't, but for a first 
um, trial, you're going to have to get the people you think are the best for this type of therapy who might be optimal. And so we think that we've identified the optimal group using this data we collected through the um, campaign study. So uh, we've now sort of addressed the question. We understand why we're using dopamine cell therapies. We understand the rationale for it. We understand the limitations of it. Uh, we understand the advantages of it. We've now looked at the patient population and said, well, I don't think everyone's suitable for it, but there is clearly a population, which is probably about 25 to 30 percent of patients who would be ideally suited for this. And ultimately, it could be anyone who benefits from dopamine therapies could have this. Uh, uh, it's obviously uh, not the easiest therapy to give, but the important point is there is a significant number of people who should benefit from this. So then the next question comes, that's great. I understand all that, but how close are we to doing that? That's great. You've identified the people, you've explained why you want to do it and what the advantages are. But has anyone got anywhere close to doing it? And have we learned anything about whether this is a viable option? So the most cynical people would say this will never work because you're going to shove a bunch of dopamine cells into someone's brain who's uh, declared that they can't keep dopamine cells alive because they got Parkinson's disease. So the cells will die completely pointless. The others would be the great optimist who says, well, you know, if you put a whole bunch of healthy young dopamine cells into the brain, the patient's taken 50 to 80 years to lose their dopamine cells. If I put them in when they're 50 to 80 and they take another 50 to 80 to lose them, I mean, they'll be dead from something else because they'll be somewhere between 100 and 160 years old. So it's likely that something else would have caught up with them. So how far have we got towards answering this question, whether these therapies have any potential to help? Well, the first question I suppose you have to ask is, uh, it's great to put back dopamine cells, but, but where are you going to get them from? So obviously, I can't get them from your brain to put them in your brain because you need the ones you've got and you've lost half of them. So I'm going to have to find the dopamine cells from somewhere else to replace those that are lost. So one place you could go is you could go, well, I could go rooting around your body and find some cell somewhere else that makes dopamine. So People have tried this. So in a gland next to the kidney, adjacent to the renal gland, which is your kidney, is the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is what gets excited when you get excited. So it pumps out adrenaline and noradrenaline. It doesn't have much in the way of dopamine, but has a small amount. And then there's a thing called the carotid body, which sits next to your carotid artery, which senses oxygen and blood pressure. And that has quite a lot of dopamine in it as well. I mean, none of, neither of those are nerve cells, but they do produce dopamine. And so people have tried taking those from their site, either by the kidney and the adrenal or the carotid body and stuffing it in the head. So that's one possibility. The second possibility would be to collect dopamine cells from aborted fetuses. So women who've decided to uh, terminate their pregnancy, uh, the aborted fetus is normally just disposed of. Uh, in a very uh, sort of... Um, uh, well-described fashion, but could we collect that tissue, dissect out the developing dopamine cells from the aborted fetal brain and put those in the head of people with Parkinson's disease? So replace the lost adult dopamine cells with the new developing ones from aborted fetuses. A third option would be, can we make dopamine cells from embryonic stem cells? So uh, the uh, making of embryos in the lab, so in vitro fertilization programs, uh, couples who go forward for that often have uh, many eggs or several eggs fertilized. They then select certain eggs, the best eggs, and they put those back into the woman. And uh, with, with uh, luck, they will then develop into a baby. Now, obviously, not all the embryos are reimplanted, so some of those are spare. They can be taken, and the cells from those embryos grown up into these embryonic stem cells, which are these cells which have the potential to turn into any cell in your body. So every single one of us on this video at one point, very early in life, was an embryonic stem cell, which is pretty amazing capacity for a cell to turn into any cell in your body. The skill here would be to get some embryonic stem cells and convince them they want to become dopamine cells. And people say that's quite hard, and I don't understand why, and I think, when it's fairly obvious why it's quite hard, because if you think how many cells you've got in your body and you only have about a million dopamine cells, if I was an embryonic stem cell, why would I want to turn into a dopamine cell? I'd much prefer to turn into a skin cell or a muscle cell or a liver cell, because we've got many more of those. But anyway, the, the principle here would be to take an embryonic stem cell from spare embryos in IVF programs and turn those 
into dopamine cells. And I'll come back to this because these aren't all, um, you know, a lot of this brings a lot of ethics as to whether you should do it. And then the final one, which has only been possible in the last 15 years since the discovery in Japan in 2006 and 2007, is this ability to take adult cells, so skin cells, blood cells, so we can take cells from any of you, uh, from your body, and then you, you turn them back into embryonic stem cells. And they obviously aren't embryonic stem cells because they haven't come from an embryo, but they're called induced pluripotent stem cells. In other words, I take an adult cell and I reprogram it back to its origins, and then I drive that into a dopamine cell. And they're called IPS. And obviously, in our programs, we're thinking about proxies. You could either take them from the patient themselves and turn them into dopamine cells. So the patient provides their own cells, that's so called autologous grafting. Or you can take them from somebody else, turn them into dopamine cells, but men, and they're called allogeneic. And I'll come back to these terms because autologous sounds absolutely cracky. That's what everyone should be doing. Take your own cells, turn them into dopamine cells, shove them in your brain. Hey, presto, all done, no ethics, no practical problems, but there are issues with that. So how far have we got with that? Well, uh, all of that was a complete waste of time with the adult cells. So that was uh, sort of very much in vogue in the 80s and 90s. Lots of trials went ahead, lots of rather dubious um, clinical trials. But the fundamental result from all of those was that although intuitively it had a lot of attractions because the patient provided their own tissue, none of the cells really provided a significant improvement or survived when transplanted into the adult brain. So no one really is, is thinking about that as the way forward. By far, the most useful information so far, and that's not to say that these other stem cell approaches are not going to be useful, but these uh, therapies with fetal cells have been extremely important in terms of proof of concept. And I'm just going to briefly talk about what's been shown. So these cells, so this was really taken forward uh, by the team of Anders Bjorklund and Ula Lindvall in Lund in the 1980s and 90s. They set about transplanting uh, about 17, 18 patients with fetal dopamine cells. So just to recap, they took people with established Parkinson's disease who responded to medication. They went and collected tissue from aborted fetuses uh, from the termination clinic. They would have to collect at least three fetuses per side of the brain. They would then dissect that bit of the brain out, turn it into a thick soup and inject it into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease and then wait and see what happened. And the results were uh, rather variable, uh, but when they worked, they worked very well. So this is a patient who went from London. I don't know if this video will work. I hope it will. We went to, uh, from London to Sweden to have this transplant. He had had Parkinson's for 10 years when he had the transplant. This is him now about 20 years after his transplant, 30 years into his Parkinson's disease. And he's actually on no medication, I think, at this point. Here we go. So this was given to me by Tom Faulkner, who's following him up in London. And although you can't see those graphs anymore over here, I'll go back. Uh, this, these two patients in London, their scores on this thing called the UPDRS, which I already showed you earlier, was uh, completely stable over a 15 year period better than before they had the transplant and about the same level as when they presented to their doctor a quarter of a century earlier with their Parkinson's disease. So these two patients clearly showed that if you put fetal dopamine cells into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease, they survived and produced long lasting full benefit. Other patients were grafted as part of this study in Sweden. This was a patient who died 24 years after they had a transplant put into their brain. They had a very uh, sustained clinical improvement. Difficult to see on this, but all the brown you see on here are the surviving dopamine cells a quarter of a century after they were put in. So this proved that the patients not only improved, but the cells survived. They didn't just improve uh, on measures that we like to record, but actually patients felt better, so quality of life. And this patient, whose post-mortem pathological brain we look at here, 15 years uh, 
earlier, so about 10 years after he had his transplant, was uh, uh, imaged in London, and it was shown that the dopamine cells in the transplant release dopamine in the same way as the normal dopamine nerve cells. So all of this was very encouraging because it shows that actually if you put fetal dopamine cells into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease, they survive long term, they get long term clinical benefits and the cells release dopamine in a normal fashion and they feel better in terms of quality of life. The question is, well, why isn't this a widespread therapy and why did I have to do the transuro study given I've already shown you that it works? And the reason was that in America, at about the time that these studies were starting to be published, the uh, uh, Clinton administration allowed federal funding for trials using fetal dopamine cells, which had been outlawed uh, for federal funding by George Bush Sr. And so two trials quickly took place uh, with uh, two teams working on it in ways that didn't fully take into account all of the complexities of Parkinson's disease and how this is done. And essentially these trials said, when you put these dopamine cells into the brains, at least in our two trials, they didn't work. The patients didn't get better. In fact, some of them developed complications. And so why are we bothering? Because it doesn't work. So uh, by the turn of the century, despite the fact that uh, these uh, cell therapies had shown some promise in Europe, in America, the two trials had shown that they didn't work. And oh, I don't know, some of my conclusions up there. Uh, anyway, and so uh, the whole thing came to an end. So 15, 20 years ago, it was sort of felt that this whole approach had no merit whatsoever. So let's all give up and go and have deep brain stimulation and let's just be content with that. So we attempted to sort of say, well, is that a sensible conclusion? Is that right? Does this not really work? Well, the trouble with that is I've just shown you a video and some pictures of people who've clearly done extremely well with it. So it may not work for everybody, but clearly for some people, it's pretty uh, transformative. So we tried to look through all of the data, everything that had ever happened in all of the trials, to work out what was uh, making some patients respond and others not, because it was a very mixed response to therapy. And people always think, well, that's a bit surprising. But if you ever go to clinic and you treat, and you'll probably all know this yourselves, you treat people with uh, cinnamon or mandopal, all sorts of responses you get to it. Some people take a tiny amount and absolutely fantastic. Some people take lots and it doesn't make much difference. Some people need a bit more and then they get a very good response. So mixed responses to therapies is very common. But what we identified was that actually there seemed to be critical factors determining whether this uh, was a good uh, going to work or not. So coming back to where I began, younger patients with less advanced disease, which is what we brought into Transuro, seem to do better. That also fitted with our studies looking at Parkinson's disease in the community. Uh, we thought there were better ways to prepare and implant the tissue. We also thought the tissue is likely to be rejected, at least in the short term, by the patient's own immune system. So we need to suppress that. Some of the trials use no immunosuppression. And also some of the studies looked at very short time points you know, uh, six months a year, and these cells take at least three to five years to have their maximum benefit. So perhaps people were looking a bit too early to see the benefits. And so all of this was factored in with our clinical studies looking at Parkinson's disease in the community, the campaign study into a new study that was funded by the European Union. And this was really to answer this question about can we repair the brain with fetal dopamine cells because by when we were awarded this grant in 2009 and 10, there was no way of making dopamine cells properly from human embryonic stem cells. And IPS cells had only been around for two or three years, so nobody could get human IPS cells in dopamine cells. So we decided that we would try and answer this question with fetal dopamine cells. So this was funded by European grant. And essentially, we had this study, which I've already mentioned, where we collect lots of patients, over 100 patients, follow them and see if they behave in the way that we expect, and then randomly select patients out of this group and offer them a transplant of fetal dopamine cells delivered into the area where we want with a device that we already knew. So this was the original grant. We were going to do an open label study, which means everybody knows they're having the treatment, both the patient and the person giving it in 20 patients. And we would then look at the results of that two years later, and then we would do a double blind trial where people would either have a transplant or a pretend transplant. And we would also have an arm in America, uh, which would also help us do this. So in five years, we were going to answer this problem. Terrific. Uh, the reality, 
was we did recruit all of the patients. Uh, we did one transplant trial, which never finished. And we only ever grafted 11 patients. And it took us 10 years, not five years to do that. Now, the question is, well, why is that? Is that because we were completely hopeless and useless, which may be true, and that's why it took us twice as long to do half as many patients? Or were there other problems that came up with this, which illustrates just how difficult it is to use fetal tissue and these types of trials? So uh, one of the first problems we had to encounter was how we were going to fund something that was running on for much longer than we thought. Now, the details of the next slide are not important, but these were the only things that delayed us in our study. The first was the regulatory authorities couldn't decide whether fetal tissue was an advanced therapy and documentation. So that took a while to resolve. Different countries, because this was European, saw our trial differently. So we couldn't start at, in all countries at the same time, which delayed us. Some of the partners, which have a particular title, kept changing who they were. So that created problems with the European Union in terms of registering who our partners were. Uh, uh, new documents and regulation came in in the UK for how we use fetal tissue, which put us back by a year. The company that was helping manage our entire grant, which was very complicated across countries, went bankrupt. Sadly, one of the people helping run the project developed a brain tumour and died. Uh, one of the other people running the uh, project disappeared uh, in a way that was a little unclear, uh, leaving a site with lots of patients and no uh, principal investigator. Uh, in Sweden, they suddenly developed problems with how they actually uh, use the tissue. Where we prepared the tissue kept breaking down. Uh, there were problems in Sweden with the room that they were using. Uh, we couldn't reliably produce uh, the tissue, reproduce the tissue as we needed at site, so we had to go back and work out why. In the UK, they wouldn't allow us to use the device that we'd originally agreed because it wasn't made in the hospital, so we had to make a new device. Our hospital moved to a complete new electronic system, so all elective surgery was cancelled for six months whilst I tried to get the system to work. Because we developed a new instrument that nobody had seen before, they couldn't clean it properly, so that delayed how we sterilised it. It had taken us so long to get here, they decided to rebuild the neurosurgical theatres where we were doing uh, the operations. Then the junior doctors went on strike, which had nothing to do with the neurosurgical theatres being refurbished, but then there was no elective surgery because we all had to cover for the junior doctors. This had taken so long that everything we'd had made at great expense in 2010 and 11 has now gone past its sell-by date, so we had to get it all revalidated. We then had to ship uh, tissue from one country to another, which created major problems, which was then compounded by the fact we decided to leave Europe, which created extra problems with shipping tissue. Just as we thought everything was falling into shape, we decided that COVID-19 should come along and disrupt all the follow-up on all the patients. And the final problem, which was the problem, major problem all the way through, was that we just simply couldn't get fetal tissue at the levels we thought we would when we started. So uh, in this particular slide, we had 100, for the time it took us to do 10 and a half patients or 11 patients grafted, we'd booked, so that's, uh, that's 22 surgeries. We had another 106 surgeries booked, which we couldn't use, of which 87 couldn't be used because we didn't have enough tissue. So whatever the results of this study, and we're still analysing it, it was never going to work because we simply could never get enough tissue. So we needed another source of dopamine cells, which is where we come into our stem cell derived dopamine cells. So there are two types, as I say, there are those made from spare embryos and there are those made from reprogramming uh, your own cells. So what about the advantage and disadvantage of this? Why would you use one versus the other? Well, both of them bring risks of tumours or growing into masses because obviously they can grow into people. Uh, well, ES cells and IPS cells can grow into all the cells of your body, and that's great when you want to be a body, but you don't really want that happening in your head or anywhere else. So there is that risk. It's a theoretical risk. I think that's been solved. The advantage of using cells from yourself, autologous, is obviously that you don't have to worry about where you get the cells from, so I can get them from you. Uh, I don't have to worry about rejection, because you've got them. So they're your cells, so your immune system's not going to reject them. And of course, they don't really bring a lot of ethical problems with them, because I'm not destroying an embryo, I'm not collecting them from aborted fetuses, so they're ethically quite neutral. Obviously, they've not been around for that long, so they've only been made for 15 years, so how safe are they? They're probably safe. And if I took them from you and put them in your head, is that the best source of cells? 
because you've obviously, as I said, declared that you can't really keep your dopamine cells because you've developed, uh, uh, you know, Parkinson's disease. So is there a risk that these cells are actually going to develop into um, uh, Parkinson's disease itself? And the other big problem is that if I took new shell cells and turned them into dopamine cells and transplanted them, then the regulation as it currently stands would mean I have to do a whole series of uh, tests on them. And it would probably cost me somewhere in the region of three to five million pounds to make new shell cells. And then if I wanted to do it myself, it would cost three to five million, uh, three to five million pounds. So there has to be a way in which they will allow us to use these cells. ES cells obviously have the advantage that they're in clinical trials and been around for 20 odd years. There are ethical problems with their derivation. So in America, there are issues with them because you have to destroy an embryo in order to use them. And there are also uh, issues with uh, mad cow disease and whether the cells have come from a country where mad cow disease exists because there's a risk you could spread it to the patient if you graft them in. I think that is not true, but that is a theoretical risk. So. Uh, that is where we stand at the moment. And when we began TransEuro, the interest in cell-based therapies for Pugsies ran with an investment of approximately zero dollars. So the world was not excited by cell-based therapies. Currently, there are several billion dollars invested in this whole uh, area. So this has really caught fire. So these are the different types of cells on this picture. So there's the embryonic stem cells, which I've already talked about. There's the iPS cells, and then there's a funny type of cells, which I wouldn't worry about, but they, they're a, a way, another way of making stem cells, which have problems with it. Now in Europe, we are working on our uh, ES-derived dopamine cells in a project called STEM-PD, which uh, uh, I lead on the clinical side, and Marlin Palmer and Agneta Kirkaby lead on the science side, and they're the brains behind the whole project really in Sweden. But we work together with a company called Nova Nordis, to actually uh, turn this into a therapy for people and to do trials. In America, they're using ES and IPS cells in a study led by Lorenz Studer and Vivian Tabar uh, in New York. Fujifilm Cellular Dynamics, which I think are now aimed by Sana Therapeutics, are developing an IPS trial in Chicago. The Mass General and Harvard Medical School have done an IPS trial. Aspen Neuroscience in California are developing an autologous, so from the patient themselves, iPS-derived dopamine cells. Japan, who invented iPS cells, are doing an iPS trial in Parkinson's disease. There are two, at least two Chinese trials using ES and pathogenetic cells. And there's a study in Australia with pathogenetic cells. So these are where people are working. Uh, the group in Australia started in 2017 with their trial. The group in Mass General must have started on one patient in 2017. The Japanese group started their IPS dopamine program in 2018. The group in New York started last year, and we plan to start this year with our trials. So there's a lot of activity going on. And in order to try and make this work in a more coordinated fashion, we set up a group which meets once a year when we're allowed to, which brings together every single person on the globe who works in this area to try and actually synergize our activities and make sure we don't make the mistakes which happen with fetal tissue. This is called G-Force. This has helped us devise new trials based on some of the things I've been talking about tonight. And we meet once a year uh, where we exchange all of this information uh, to plan our trials. As I say, this has now entered clinical trials. So in Japan, this was a very important paper which led to their clinical trials. So this study, which was published, I think, in 2016, uh, basically what they did is they took iPS cells, so induced pluripotent stem cells they made from people with Parkinson's disease and people without Parkinson's disease. They transplanted them into monkeys with Parkinson's, which they had induced by killing off the dopamine cells. And what they found was at 12 months uh, and even at two years, the cells survived equally well, whether they came from patients or not patients, and the animals got better. And it was on the back of that that they announced that they were going for their first patient. They grafted in 2018. And when I last spoke to Jun Takahashi, who runs this trial last year, they'd done five patients. So that trial is up and running, and the results of that will probably be out in the next couple of years. There was this paper that appeared in the New England Journal a couple of years ago where a patient had uh, provided their own cells. So this was autologous. So this is the patient gave their cells. They were made into iPS cells. They were turned into dopamine cells. They were transplanted. 
In this particular case, there was no major change when people looked at dopamine in the brain. There was no major change in some of the measures, this UPDRS, which I've already mentioned, but the patient felt much better for the transplant. So uh, it's a little unclear exactly what that's telling us. Uh, in our hands, we've been using these human ES cells. We can get them to work very well. They always work well. And a key point with this is the um, scalability of it. So if I take a six well plate, which is about uh, that big, a little uh, whatever that is, Lonely Planet pocket guy. So I take that into the, into the uh, culture hood and it's got six wells of embryonic stem cells in there, six little wells. Then uh, uh, about 16 days later, I can have made enough dopamine cells to treat uh, uh, 500 patients. So uh, if I have a robot and I take a thousand plates, right, that is 500,000 people I can treat with pugsy. Well, that is pretty much the whole world who might be suitable for this therapy. Now you think, well, that's great. But actually for a company, that is a major, major, major incentive because I can now suddenly make a therapy at quite a low cost, charge quite a lot and actually get quite a good return for it. So financially, this now becomes very viable. Secondly, because it's very short to make uh, time to make cells, it's highly reproducible. So it's a very unlikely I'm going to have to worry about the cells being very different from batch to batch. And so this is what we've used in our trial. Uh, and this gives you some idea of what we've been doing. So this is really being led by Marlin Palmer and Agneta Kirkaby in Lund and Copenhagen. So these are the cells we've made from a cell uh, uh, from Scotland. We differentiate them, we do lots of testing, we have to test them to show they're safe, which we've done, we have to show that they work, and we've now just submitted the application to the Swedish authorities, and we will submit it to the UK authorities, uh, hopefully next month, with a view to starting our trial with our embryonic stem cell derived dopamine cells uh, in the first half of this year. Uh, and on the back of that, we hope there will be further trials uh, with Nova Nordis uh, next year and the year after. So this has now become a reality. These trials are here. Whether it works or not, we don't know, because that's the point of the trials. Should they work? Well, they should work, because there's a very logical reason for it. Will they work in everybody and give us the answer straight away? No, because that doesn't happen. But we do expect to see some very clear results, which should enable us to take this forward. And whilst Big Pharma has disadvantages in terms of working with them because of the timelines they often work under, they are very interested in it and they have the capability, the money and the know-how to quickly take this all the way to market if it looks as though it's really worth. So unlike a lot of academic studies where we sort of potter along and, and find things and we go on and try and find some more money, this has real backing. And so I'm optimistic that if this works, it's going to move quite quickly through the trials and we will see benefits. So to conclude, uh, what I hope I've shown you tonight is that being with Park disease, there's a very logical reason why they should respond to dopamine cell-based therapies, but it's clear that not everybody will. And some people won't. So if you're 85 and you get Parkinson's disease, tablets will do you fine. You don't need someone sticking things in your head because you've got enough to get on with and your drugs will do you fine. If you're 55, it's a very different uh, situation. They're not curative. They don't get rid of the underlying pathology. They don't deal with all the losses of cells you see in the brains, but in the right people, they will deal with the core problem. We now have protocols and data that support the use of these in clinical trials. The data is very reliable, it's very reproducible, and it's very encouraging. And these trials are now starting in different places in people with moderately advanced poxy. So these first trials, because of the ethics of it, are going to be in people who are looking at some more invasive therapy because the ethics committee won't say, well, stick it in someone with early stage disease uh, because they've got a lot to lose. Uh, uh, and it's experimental. In theory, if it works as I say, then it, there's no reason to believe this couldn't be a first line therapy for everyone with Parkinson's disease in the future. But for the early trials, it'll be people who are fluctuating, looking possibly at deep brain stimulation. And our trial should start this year, uh, assuming everyone approves uh, what we need to uh, do. And we're optimistic that will be the case. And so finally, I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, at this uh, rather late hour. Uh, I'd like to thank for all the people who've supported the work over the years. Uh, this is Ask My Lab with uh, Caroline's group uh, when we were last allowed to meet. 
so this was about uh, three weeks, I think, four weeks before we were shut down in 2020. And this is us about six weeks before we were shut down in 2020, where we met with the team in Sweden, which is the uh, combined team of us in Cambridge, the imaging team in London and the team in Sweden, who've worked together uh, to make this a reality, at least in Europe, with stem cell and fetal derived dopamine cells. And with that, I will finish and stop sharing. Roger, thank you very, very much. And actually, I'm amazed how timely your presentation is given the importance of 2022 in the, the start of the trial. So you're almost coming to us just before starting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there are a few questions here that I will, uh, I will focus on. I think that may be a very basic question that I think a lot of people will have in mind. How do patients register their interest or willingness to participate in these trials? What do we do if we want to raise our hand? Uh, I mean, I think the easiest way is just to drop me an email. Mm -hmm. I mean, the current situation is we're not recruiting. And the reason we're not recruiting is we haven't got approval to do the trial. So it would be unfair, say, Michelle say, I want to have a trial, I come in your yes. trial, great, come along. And then I say, actually, they won't allow us to do it. I mean, I don't think that will happen, but the ethics committee won't allow us to recruit people till we have approval. So once we have approval, it's good to have a list of, of patients. Probably for our first trial, we will be using patients that we've been following up in TransEuro because obviously we've been following them for many years. On the back of this, as I say, there's, there is a plan for a further trial, which will have many more patients in it. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, having people who are interested is always useful to know. So if people just drop me an email, I can stick my uh, email. That's very kind. Actually, what I will do, please go, go ahead and do this, but as we circulate the recording, I will also, yeah. uh, to the participants today, I will also make sure that they, your email... And the other thing that's very again. useful is if people can tell me where they live, because for the first trials, it, it will also be people have to live quite local to where we are, because yes. you know it's a very intense programme. As it becomes more routine, is what we're hoping, it will become easier to recruit people from further away. And obviously, I know you have people from all over the world here, so the other places, would, mm -hmm. you know, there's the group in New York. You'd, I mean, Claire Henschliff used to be the neurologist there. She's left. But Vivian Tabar, who's the neurosurgeon, would be the person to contact in New York. Um, uh, I would have to look up who it is in Harvard. And then in Japan, it's Jun Takahashi at Kyoto. Thank you very much. Uh, an interesting question here as well is basically... Um, uh, whether the people who took part in the previous trials were genetically sequenced or did anyone look at the genetic basically composition to see if there was a correlation between probably success and stem cell with the, some gen genetic marker they might have? Yeah, it's a very good question and I wish I had an answer to it. It, it was a bit of reluctance to actually look at the genes. Um, and it's also a bit difficult to know how much is likely to impact. So we spent quite a bit of time thinking about genes and transplantation. Um, and so there are two things to say to that. One is people who carry this, this um, there's a gene called GBA, glucoserebrosidase is what it codes for. So Gaucher's disease. So if you inherit two abnormal GBA genes, you get a thing called Gaucher's disease, which affects your spleen and liver and bone marrow. Mm -hmm. If you inherit one of those abnormal genes, it increases your risk of Parkinson's disease. And if you get Parkinson's disease, you probably advance a bit more quickly with it. So there has been this question about whether we should be screening people for GBA and excluding them. But the data is not really reliable enough on that. Now, if you look at other forms of Parkinson's disease, such as Parkin, which is a very rare gene that gives people Parkinson's disease, typically in their 20s and 30s, they have a very dopamine pure disease, but they probably don't have Parkinson's disease because they never get the pathology of Parkinson's disease. So, and given it's so rare and it's not Parkinson's disease, we've, we've tended not to go looking for that. And so we haven't really looked at the genes in this because the numbers are not high. In the early studies, so you remember the first gene for Parkinson's disease was discovered in 97. So for a lot of these studies in the 80s and 90s, no one collected DNA. Think there were any genes associated with it so so some for some of them we don't have the, the samples to look at it so the simple answer is we don't know but i suspect there probably isn't a clear genetic basis for why people do well or badly mm -hmm. thank you very much sarah is asking whether there are some examples of successful cell-based therapies i think you have given some of them already 
Yes. So um, I would say that the most successful transplants have shown um, that patients can, can have surviving cells for a quarter of a century with, I mean, that video, I mean, and it didn't work that well, probably because of the bandwidth and everything. I mean, the patient looks essentially normal. When I was first shown that video, I said, why did someone graft someone who didn't have Parkinson's disease? And uh, I, I mean, when it works, it works very well. It's just hasn't been consistent. And that's been the problem with it, because if only two in 10 people do well with it, you haven't really got a therapy because, you know, with the right selection, you know, nine out of 10 will do well with DBS, deep brain stimulation. So I think there really works. Uh, the question is, can you get it to work consistently? And can you get it to be a big enough response that it's competitive with what else we've got out? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Motto is asking a question about the DAT scans, and he's asking whether the DAT, the DAT scans, uh, you may see the question yourself, are of any use in defining the rate of dopamine cell death. And uh, therefore, not, yeah, not really, because the DAT scans which are used in hospitals don't have the sensitivity to pick up the changes. So, what DAT scans are very good. So, this is looking at dopamine transporters, which is a little protein that sits at the end of your dopamine nerve and takes dopamine back up. So, when you've lost it, you've obviously lost your dopamine nerve terminal and it's good for helping with the diagnosis of parkinson's because it shows you've got a dopamine loss but it's not really sensitive enough to pick up changes <laughs> time and it's not very good for picking up dopamine grafting so we use a thing called pet studies which is a much sensitive positron emission tomography which is very sensitive and that really shows you whether you've got surviving transplants thank you very much so Martin Ronsby is asking us whether transplanted cells gradually develop Lewy bodies. They do. So, yeah. so it, 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 well, with fetal tissue, it's been shown that uh, after 10 years, about one to 2% of the cells that per year thereafter appear to develop the pathology of Parkinson's disease. So this has opened a whole new field of um, interest in Parkinson's disease that the disease uh, comes about by the spread of the protein. So I'm sure people have talked about this before. So alpha cytonuclein, the protein that, that's associated with Parkinson's disease, can spread from one cell to another. And in spreading, it passes the disease from one nerve cell to another. And so the theory is that the transplanted dopamine cells, which are these young dopamine cells, get past the abnormal cytonuclein from the Parkinsonian brain and seed pathology in the transplant. Uh, I mean, it's not proven, but that seems a reasonable theory. And the patient who died 24 years after they had a transplant, uh, about 20 odd percent of those cells had Lewy body pathology. 80% uh, did. So at that rate of accumulation, the transplant would die probably about 40 to 50 years after you put it in, which again, you know, isn't something most people will worry about. Uh, and going forward, people have thought, well, the reason the alpha synuclein causes pathology in the transplanted cells is it is the abnormal alpha synuclein comes in, it finds the normal alpha synuclein in the transplanted cell and turns it into a bad form and gives pathology. So one of the areas which people are working on is can you make a stem cell, stem cell derived dopamine cell that has no alpha synuclein in it? So you engineer out alpha synuclein, you have so called alpha synuclein knockout cells. And therefore, they can never develop pathology because they don't contain any alpha synuclein. So there's a hope that you would be able to uh, stop the disease spreading by engineering the cells so they could never acquire the pathology of Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a theoretical risk. I don't worry about that. Good. Thank you very much. Um, Gary was uh, asking whether people who have had DBS are still suitable for stem cell therapies. Uh, not at the moment, and the reason for that is that the regulatory authorities will obviously uh, uh, reasonably say you don't know how your stem cell behaves in the normal brain. Do you know what happens if there's an electrode there that's stimulating away? Could it possibly change the behaviour of the cells, which aren't implanted in the same site, but could it affect how the cells behave and such? And we don't know. I mean, I can't think why, but they would always say that, that because you don't know that, you shouldn't be doing it. Now, my own view is that that is a perfectly reasonable position. As we acquire more information and we see how the cells behave, if they really work and they show good responses, then there's no reason to believe you couldn't give them to anybody, really. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, Philippe de Cleva uh, was interested in your, your, your mentioning PET testing. 
is asking a clarification. Is PT testing uh, able to tell you how your PD is, is progressing? Is that what it does? Yes. Yeah, so, so PET imaging, positron emission tomography, is a very sensitive way of look. So basically, the idea of it is you inject something which is radioactive, and it gets taken up by the system. So in this case, you often give F dopa or a thing called PE two I, and it gets taken up into dopamine cells, and then it releases positrons, which you then capture on a camera. And obviously, the more positrons that release, the bigger the signal. And it's a very, very sensitive system. I mean, it's blooming expensive. So in the UK, if you have a PET scan for research, it's about £6,000 per scan. So, uh, you know, that soon blows the budget on any trial if you're not careful. But the, but the beauty is it's very, very high um, sensitivity. So you can follow people over time in terms of watching dopamine disappear or dopamine coming back with transplants in a way that a DAT scan can't. So it's a very sensitive way, and you can look at different systems with it, depending what radioactive ligand you inject. But there are specialist centres, so we do most of ours at the Hammersmith Hospital and in Vicro down there. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Jane is asking a very specific question. Um, she's asking whether someone who had early onset in their 20s, and that person is now 63, would that person still be considered suitable for transplant, given that she has only taken levodopa for the last six years? Uh, I can't see any reason why not. I mean, obviously, it depends on these early trials. We would be using people uh, in trials or recruiting people to trials, as I say, who are heading towards deep brain stimulation rather on stable doses of medication. Mm -hmm. Because, as I was saying, the ethics committee will say, these are patients who are looking at invasive therapy of some sort. So having invasive cell-based therapy is more justified than people who are stable on drugs, uh, given how little is known about how these cells will behave. But in theory, there's no reason to think uh, patients uh, couldn't have this. The people who will almost certainly be excluded from stem cell-derived dopamine cells, which is what I get quite a few emails about, is people who've clearly never responded to dopamine drugs. So sadly, if you don't respond to dopamine drugs, yes. whatever reason, there's no reason you would respond to a dopamine cell therapy because it's the same principle. But people who respond well to therapy, almost regardless of age, you know, they could they could have it. Thank you, Roger. That's very encouraging. A question from Mark, who is asking whether people who have had first PTT pallidotelanic tractotomy uh, are eligible. So people who have had um, lesions not in the first instance. Okay. Had a if it's like DBS. ultrasound, or you've had a you know an old lesion in the first instance, probably not. Because again, for these first trials, you have to pick what you think are the, <laughs> the, the to see the benefits. And anyone who's had surgery disturbing retracts, it will be harder to be certain what you're looking at. Again, it's not to say you couldn't do it in the future, but for the first trials, uh, we would not select such patients. Thank you very much. A question from Saeed, uh, who is referring to a process that I'm not aware of, so I'm going to read the question. He's asking whether yeah. he, would it be possible you see the question about epigenetic yeah. alternation? Yeah, so, I mean, um, it's a bit hard with Parkinson's disease because we don't know what the gene is. But if I take another disease, which I work on, which is not to do with Parkinson's disease, but similar, a disease called Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder where people develop problems of movement, thinking, and psychiatric problems. And that's driven by a single gene abnormality. And so given that there's a single gene that causes it, if I can switch off the gene or what the gene produces, then in theory, I should be able to cure the disease. So people have been quite interested in time to do this by silencing what the gene produces. So using these things called antisense, which bind against what the gene produces to stop it coming out or you can try and switch off the gene. So all of these are makes perfect sense for diseases which have a clear genetic basis, which, which a lot of Parkinson's does not. So most people with Parkinson's do not have a clear gene that causes it. Even if you know there's a clear gene that causes it, you do have a slight problem, which is that you need to switch it off uh, and just that gene, because you don't want to switch any other genes off. Uh, uh, and you want to switch off the abnormal gene in every cell in your brain the rest of your life and that my friend is quite a challenge uh, so people have thought quite hard about it and are working on it in fact i had a conversation with one of my former uh, students who's now in california who's trying to do this with this new gene editing technique so 
we're thinking of some pretty wacky experiments, which I'm not sure the Ethics Committee will allow us to, to do, but to try and work out how far we can spread this across the human brain and get it to switch off genes. Um, so in theory, for genetic diseases, so if someone has a clear gene that causes Parkinson's disease, it's an obvious attraction. But as I would say, 95 plus percent of people with Parkinson's disease do not have a clear gene that causes it. Thank you, Roger. Two questions related to fasting. I don't know if that is something that will echo with you. Uh, one question came early on. It was someone practicing water fasting in the carnivorous, carnivorous uh, regime. And then Deborah just came up with a question a few minutes ago about intermittent fasting and cleaning up of folded alphanucleic cells. Are mm. these things that you're familiar with? Uh, not particularly. I, I, what I would say about uh, diet and sleep, I suppose, these are two things which, which sort of relate to it. So, so, I mean, fasting has always been quite an interesting idea, uh, I think, because obviously you change your metabolism and you make ketones and things of that nature, which, and ketogenic diets have been used quite a lot in, in um, neurology for treating certain conditions, particularly epilepsy. So changing diets and fasting has been always this question about how good is it for your general health? And does it improve brain health or brain diseases? And I think it's a little unclear, especially for things like Parkinson's disease. So in itself, I'm not sure about how much that makes an impact. Secondly, related to that is this idea of the microbiome. So all the bugs you have in your gut, which influence diseases you get and how your diseases behave. And therefore what you eat, including prebiotics and such like, changes your, the bacteria of your gut, which then changes your whole health of your body and brain. Uh, and is that a good thing for Parkinson's disease? And it probably is. The only trouble is we don't know how it's helpful and what you need to do to make it helpful. Um, but that's an interesting thing. And the third thing, which I'm very interested in, is sleep. So sleep is very important for your brain. So this is best shown with Alzheimer's disease. That the, One of the proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease is a protein called amyloid, which, which sort of gets deposited outside your nerve cells. And when you're asleep at night, it all gets washed away. Uh, whilst you're sleeping. So if you don't sleep well, uh, all of those proteins, which are sort of like the rubbish from your, from your day's thinking, sticks around. Uh, so sleeping is a good way of clearing your brain of all of this uh, rubbish. Now, whether it does that for alpha-synuclein, I don't know, but I think it's fair to say that actually a good night's sleep, A, makes your Parkinson's much better. So one of the commonest causes of people not doing well with Parkinson's is they don't sleep well. Um, and if they've had a bad night's sleep, they have a bad day. But I think it also may have something fundamentally to do with the health of your brain. So I'm a great believer in good sleep is important. Amen to that. I think we would all agree. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of questions, one from Spotlight, um, who is basically asking us about uh, how long it would take to see progress or improvement following the implant. Because you're yeah, following your patients over a long period of time, but when do you start seeing something? Yeah, so it's a very good question. And this is a, creates a certain amount of um, interesting discussion with pharma because uh, what you're putting in is you're not putting in a drug, you're putting in cells which have to survive, then they have to develop, then they have to connect up. And to some extent, you have to learn how to reuse them. So uh, uh, with the fetal tissue, the maximum benefit is seen three to five years after you put them in. Now, the problem that creates for pharma is I want to do a trial and I want to look at two doses. So I put in dose one and they'll say, Roger, when do you want to decide where you're going to give dose two? And I'll say three to five years time. And then they laugh and they say, well, we can't take five years. Can we do three to six? No, you can't do three to six months because you won't see anything. So trying to find a sweet spot, which gives you something that's reliable, is, is going to be quite a challenge. Um, it's important because obviously, uh, A, it has implications for how we do trials and work with the farmer on, on waiting long enough before we decide on it. Secondly, for patient selection for our trials. So I've already said we will be taking patients who are looking at more invasive therapy, but we can't afford to be taking patients who are looking at the fact that they're going to run into trouble in the next few months and going to need DBS before the year's out because we can't wait long enough. They can't wait long enough for the transplant to have an effect. So it will take some time. Um, quite how long, we don't know, but I would imagine you'll probably need at least two to three years before you see really the maximum benefit. Thank you, that's very, very clear. A question from Dietrich. He's asking whether when comparing immunotherapy with antibodies to stem cell therapy, 
where do you expect to see more potential? I guess probably stem cell, given your specialism in that area. But uh... well, I, th I think you see. I think they're mutually. Uh, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So, I mean, the trouble is we always think of one therapy versus the other. So at the beginning, I sort of added to that uh, discussion by sort of saying, well, you can either have cell therapies or disease-modifying therapies. I mean, if they work, there's no reason you can't have both of them. So, you know, Michelle, you pitch up, you say, right, you've lost a few dopamine cells. I'll shove those in your head. That deals with that. Now you can have some antibody therapy to stop the alpha synuclein getting into your transplant and spreading through your body. Here's a bit of exenatide, which will probably do something to slow down the disease. Mm -hmm. Protect your transplants as well. Thank you very much. So there's no reason you can't combine these therapies. Obviously, for your first trials, if I go to the you know regulatory authorities, I'm going to take a group of patients, put some cells in, give them an antibody therapy, try some drug repurposing uh, and some physio, and change their diet, and I'll see if that makes them better. They'll say, well, that's. I mean, it's great if it works, but if it works, which one of those has worked? And so, you know, the difficulty is how you devise your trials in the beginning. But there's no reason. That you can't combine these therapies going forward. Thank you very much. Maria is coming back to your comment about sleep and basically she's asking whether taking sleep aids uh, still gives you the same benefit of sleep. Yeah without. so I think trying to naturally uh, I think natural therapies you know sort of um, good sleep hygiene melatonin these type of things are a good thing. The problem with most drugs we give people to help them sleep is they do help them sleep but they don't put sleep back to normal. Uh, so that you have a very regular pattern of sleep where you have, you know, your, you act out, you don't act out your dreams, you have your dreams and then your slow wave sleep. So we don't have drugs that do that very well. And there may be more natural ways of doing that. And so we're looking at some of these where you can actually wear devices that can read G's and hopefully try and restore your sleep back to a more normal way. But that is a big challenge. But I think one of the extraordinary things is we're just very bad uh, because we're looking at one of the major reasons why we don't sleep right now is we have lots of screens that we can stare at 24 hours a day uh, and people like to call you and leave you messages and whatsapps uh, and so it's quite easy to have very disrupted uh, sleep by virtue of the fact we live in an electronic age and actually covid i think has been quite good on that for travel so travel is another thing which everyone loves to do and i'm not putting people off travel but I was as guilty as anybody else. You spend your whole time flying around, never actually getting into one time. I don't think that's good for your brain. And there have been studies where people have looked at long haul pilots versus short haul pilots. And it's not good for your brain. You look at the degrees of atrophy, shrinkage of the brain. So I have a question of now, if you don't mind. Actually, I just wondered if you would have an opinion about red light therapy, which is absolutely outside of your key area of competence, but actually, or especially. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, well, I don't really, so I don't really have an answer to Michelle because I don't know nothing. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Uh, it, it, I think, the, so a lot of people will ask me about these type of therapies and say, and it's very easy for me to say, well, I think it's complete nonsense, absolutely. I have no idea why you'd have that therapy. And um, it's completely wrong to say that. And the reason to say it's completely wrong is, A, you know, often these therapies are being thought through quite carefully as to what, how they might work. And most of them have never been the subject of a trial. So what I say to most people is, I've no idea whether it works. It might well work. It's just never been shown in a trial to work or not work. And so people say, oh, it doesn't work because it's never been trialed. And you go, no, no, it's just never been. If it's not been in a trial, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, you can't think it works or not. And, and, and a lot of these trials are very difficult too. So the one I always think is very difficult is, um, you know, an exercise trial. So I always talk about the difficulties of doing an exercise trial. You know, what you do is you... You have 100 people in the trial and so on the screen you know i take 50 of you into the exercise arm of my trial and the other 50 not and the idea is to see whether exercise makes you better well the 50 are in my exercise trial I think that's terrific you know i'm down the gym five days a week doing x y and z terrific the other 50 of you join the trial because you wanted to do exercise you think well i'm in the control arm here i'm just reading the newspaper and a deck chair i'll go down the gym twice five times a week and at the end of it you think well exercise has made no difference and that's because the control arm who are supposed to be sitting in the deck chair reading the paper have done twice as much exercise as the exercise because they joined the trial to do the exercise. So, so trying to control for these type of therapies is very difficult. And it's one of the difficulties with a lot of trials is um, looking at sort of supplements is people surreptitiously go off and take the supplements anyway. And so it can be hard to, to deal with that. So I think 
you know, there's lots to be discovered in, in plant studies. And, you know, one of the things I always encourage people to do is to, you know, get to their nearest research centre and sign. doesn't mean you have to do the trials, but it's, it's very, um, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things which is very true of trials, anyone in a trial does well. The famous professor of stroke medicine, he said, if I have a stroke, I want to be in a trial and I don't want the active treatment. Uh, I'll do very well <laughs> just being looked after. <laughs> uh, and it may be a cool selection, but it's very, people in trials do very well. Roger, thank you very, very much for such a nice presentation. Uh, you can see on the chat, there is like at least 10 or 12 uh, positive comments from people as, the, as we're getting close to nine o'clock and we're getting to put an end to the session. I think that it was uh, well exceeding or very high expectations. So thank you very much. Thank you also, I would say almost more importantly for dedicating your career to providing solutions to people who suffer from Parkinson's and Huntington. Uh, we, are, we are definitely rooting for you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening. And to our audience, I would just say that we'll be sending you a little survey within a week to get to know you better, um, but also more importantly, to see which are the topics that you would like us to cover in the future. So uh, I'm just asking you, this is not only asked to the participants we had tonight, please just do respond to the survey. Your feedback and your input is very important to making sure that our sessions in the future are as good as they were today. So Roger, thanks again very, very much. And thank you to your audience. See you everyone very soon. Yeah, thanks Roger. Thank Bye-bye now. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, 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 Michelle. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.